Also, we would have a crossover, so that we can shove it to the other side. Uh, cost of this system, we often talk about about three and a half billion dollars. So there it is. And by the way, it's in 2006 dollars. So it's a constant dollar. Okay. So with the inflation, of course, this is going to go up. Well, okay. Let, let, let me explain about overruns. The why we feel somewhat comfortable at this number uh, right now. That's, the, that's because, okay, when you look at it, oh, my, my pointer died. Um, the, the construction cost, the part that you need to worry about overrun the most, is about $1.8 billion. About half of this total project cost that we talk about. And then we are required in this federal process to include a pretty good, pretty good chunk of uh, contingency, 26%. And in addition, well, okay, no, wait, let's go through this. Right away, uh, because we utilize the available right away, we don't have that much take. So we're talking about in a neighborhood of $70 million. We're doing the more detailed engineering. So as we do the engineering, there may be more identification of the additional right away. So this can go up. And the vehicles, we're talking about about $200 million for the vehicles. And the soft cost, the engineering cost, is $685 million. And on top of all that, we, we added another 6% contingency. So the total contingency, when you compound all this, is over 30%. So that should take care of some of that. And then the soft cost, our estimate is right now it's 30%. You know, typically these projects don't take 30% soft cost. Yes? Oh, that's the uh, that's the uh, property that we're going to purchase. Oh. Right. Um, most of this alignment, as you saw, runs on the roadway right away. That's something the state or the city already owns. So the, the right away we have to take are about three different categories, roughly. One is when we're transitioning from one roadway to another, say like from uh, Queen Street to uh, Kona. We're going to go through about half a dozen properties, so we would have to purchase them. And the other one is the uh, um, when we put up the station on the elevator structure, the, the uh, elevator shaft, escalator, uh, staircase, they're going to land, and then they, they don't always fit within the street right, right away, although within a sidewalk area. So we have to take the property like that. And then the you know, power station, too. We're going to have a sub power station almost every uh, 2,000 meters, so that, that we have we need property for that. And the third one is that when we do this touchdown on the sidewalk area, of course, that we narrow the sidewalk or block sidewalk for ADA compliant, we have to widen the sidewalk, so we have to encroach into somebody's property, and we're going to buy that. So that's the right of way of land purchasing cost. Now the balance sheet from the argument is Okay, let's this is to show you the revenue side and the uh, uh, expenditure side. Top half is the revenue. First line, GET surcharge making about three billion dollars in two thousand six dollars. And when you inflate that, it's about four billion dollars. And FDA, Federal Transit Administration, we, well, what we can expect from uh, their participation in today's dollar or, or 2006 dollar, about $700 million. And then the uh, future dollar will be uh, close to a billion dollars. By the way, you know, we've been talking to FDA from the day one on this project and then telling them, we are, we're going to be coming to ask you for about a billion dollars. And they said, that's reasonable. As recent as last month, we told them, how about with the inflation, maybe a little over one billion, um, their comeback is fine. 
So we're very confident that this is not out of line um, and kind of a dollar, uh, federal dollars we're going to be asking. Um, just recently, last year, uh, New York got $2.6 billion. Phoenix got $900 million. So you know, this is a reasonable range of, uh, to anticipate from the feds. So the total, $3.7 billion. And the uh, cost side, fixed guide capital cost, as I showed you in an earlier slide, about $3.5 billion. And if you were to inflate on the year of expenditure, about $4.6 billion. And the, there are times when the, we have a intensity of the construction exceeding the uh, um, the revenue coming from GET, so we would have to borrow the money to make up that. And so they're paying the interest, $250 million in 2006 dollars, and 410 in future dollar. So total, we can balance. And this is the reason why we're saying we can afford the system. Now, the decision, therefore, the made technology selection by panel was done, and Simon can get into that in a little more detail. And the decision is still to be made. As I said, although the panel selected the steel and steel, city council has the pending legislation to, well, hopefully they don't do something different, but you know, they can do whatever they do, and the design details. Now, these are the um, four technologies that the, uh, the panel looked at. Upper uh, left is the bus system or rubber tire. Upper right is the monorail. I think that's in Okinawa, Hitachi monorail. Lower right is the magnetic, magnetic levitation in Nagoya. And uh, lower left is the steering steel in uh, Kuala Lumpur. This is the uh, Miami system, steel and steel. Vancouver, steel and steel. Vancouver's old steel and steel car, Vancouver's new steel and steel in, at the station. Now the uh, schedule. Uh, we're in, of course, 2008, so we're in the process of uh, requesting. <laughs> Because we are here. So this part is getting into preliminary engineering. This is the next step after do the conceptual engineering. And this is the uh, step in engineering we are pre preparing the details so that we can uh, do the uh, environmental impact statement based on the engineering detail. EIS process started. And the uh, phase one, we intend to start the, this system, building the system from the west end, about six mile in length, using local money, prior to receiving the federal funds. And that was the headline uh, this past weekend. But that's the uh, um, very typical way of building these systems. It's nothing unusual about that, nothing risky. Of course, you know, risk is, okay, what, what if the federal government stops this subsidy? Or what if the politicians change their mind? But technically, regulatorily, and economically, um, there's no risk in doing it this way. So, first, the first segment can start with a design-built con contract. And the final design for the rest of the system follows that. And then while we're doing the final engineering, then once we get the federal government comfortable with the final cost, they'll come to the table and negotiate how much federal funds we're going to get. That's called full funding grant agreement. That's the step here in 2010. And then once that's all done, then we'll start the construction for the rest of the system. And the opening of that first segment in 
toward the end of uh, year 2012. So that's our schedule. And this is what I just said in words. April 2008, select fixed, uh, fixed cargo technology, that's the city council action. Spring 2008, we, we plan to enter into a preliminary engineering with agreement from the uh, federal government. And they released the uh, draft environmental impact statement uh, later this year, September. And then they uh, issued the first procurement document, meaning RFP, uh, for the design bill and for phase one. In December 2008, we'll issue the procurement document for the transit vehicles. And the releasing of the FEIS in June 2009, and getting the record of decision. ROD, that signifies the ending of the uh, environmental process. And then the, at that time, we can issue notice to proceed to the selected design bill contract. And in February 2010, we issued notice to proceed for the transit vehicles. And the intake final design for phase two, three, four following phases in summer 2010. And the uh, full funding grant agreement with the federal government for the portion of the federal share in spring 2010, 2011. Okay, that's all I got. Um, yeah, maybe easier if I take the question on my part of it. Uh, early in the talk, you mentioned uh, that the roadways needed $3 million, and there was not, uh, I guess, a way to pay for that. Uh, so what I'm wondering is, uh, and, and you said that uh, the selection of alignment, um, uh, there was also uh, uh, H1 was ruled out uh, because of certain plan improvements. So I'm a little bit confused as to uh, whether our roadways uh, will not keep up with the uh, population increase that requires the three billion dollars uh, and this is a project that's separately funded and is really separate from that problem that's what I would like to understand okay. I'm sorry if I confused you but what it is is that there we can reasonably expect separate three billion dollars for highway projects over the next 20 years and that money is going to be used to do this uh, highway improvements but that's not enough. We need to do more to take care of the future congestion. And that's when the, the, uh, the Swag Metropolitan Planning Organization handed over that part of the plan to us to say, okay, find out what's the best uh, transit improvements to take care of this excess uh, traffic congestion beyond what uh, $3 billion pays for, uh, the, uh, $3 billion improvements in the highway project pays for. All right, thank you. Uh, the second question I had, uh, the location of stations, especially in the less densely populated areas, um, was that based on uh, property convenience, uh, lo lower cost, or was that based on uh, the ability to attract ridership? How did that play into yeah. the selection of the station locations in the less densely populated portions? Station locations, yes, it was set by many different issues. One, yes, there is the available or existing land use. And then there's another one, is the, the, the possibility of the well, developability of the land around it, such as the closeness to the uh, uh, beach or the, or the park or the school then we'll take them out because it's not likely that we can easily uh, redevelop the school site or the park sites. So we look at the future possibility of land use. And then also, other part is the connectability to other land transportation. Uh, if we have some really busy, congested uh, traffic in the intersection, then we try to avoid that. And then we also, other part we look at it is uh, 
the, how easy it is to connect with the buses. Is there some good location for the bus interface? And, and, uh, and the walkability, when there is a topographic difference in one area to another area. So that, that's the kind of stuff we do. And then the finalizing the station locations. And then what we do is we, we put that into a simulation with the population in the area and then also the, uh, the likelihood of that population, if they're a production site, going to which employment site. And if this is an employment site, then where is it that we're likely to be attracting the commuters to that site? And then look at, do the simulation to do the uh, uh, ridership forecast. Then we start moving around until we get some kind of optimum location. And that's how we did the station signs. Before you take any more questions, we've got another part of the presentation here in the right side. So why don't we do that, and then we'll get both of them back up here to do questions. That'd be okay? Because you don't want to miss the second part. Yeah, that way. Is that right? We, yeah, sure. Then we can fight over who's going to answer. Right. <laughs> civil engineers who spend their entire career with a public works department or with a consulting engineering firm in one place. We thought, we, we together decided it would be a more exciting life if we followed the very big projects. I like large projects and I spent all my career working on large uh, public transportation projects. So uh, I come to Hawaii only recently. Um, I, I, I was a part of a consulting firm where we had an office here in Hawaii and I came out regularly, so I'm familiar with the island, but I've moved here uh, only recently and uh, for this project. Um, my part of the presentation is going to take off from the decision to do a fixed guideway transit system. Uh, so I'll let Toro address all the questions about whether a fixed guideway system or some other kind of system is appropriate. Uh, what I'm trying to address is, if it is going to be a fixed guideway transit system uh, as a solution, what is, the, what is the most appropriate solution? And the way the city decided to uh, undertake that, uh, after much discussion and much uh, um, uh, detailed study about how we should do that, was to uh, bring in a panel of outside experts uh, uh, who are familiar with these kinds of projects and the kinds of solutions that have been done in other cities and to have them take a look at all the information that we could generate uh, and that included sending out a general request to the various suppliers of fixed guideway technology systems to get detailed data on their systems, evaluate all that data, uh, make a recommendation uh, and uh, then we would carry forward. So I'm going to talk about the technology selection panel which has been the topic of great discussion in the newspapers over the past few weeks. Toro, I didn't have to bother with where we are today because I took that same slide and put a put the nice blue arrow on it. So where are we? We're in the middle of the environmental review process and we are undertaking preliminary engineering. Now if we kind of hone in on exactly what's happening uh, now, uh, a little closer to the, the first segment project, you see that in order to get our first segment underway, uh, we need to be designing uh, vehicles uh, for this fixed guideway system very quickly because we have only about a year or so of design then we put out a procurement a, a bid on the street to have manufacturers bid on the system and we need to be in manufacture by the end of uh, 2009. We need to give our notice to proceed to a uh, system supplier. So we have a very tight schedule, uh, not an unreasonable schedule, but a very tight schedule that we're trying to adhere to. Uh, as Toro noted, there were four uh, technologies uh, to be considered, and these are these are uh, recommendations that came out of the alternatives analysis before uh, uh, our current involvement on the project. And, and basically, they're what's been done around the world for various systems. Everything that we could uh, uh, get our hands on indicated the systems fall into these. The available systems fall into these four uh, categories that you see here, and. Uh, we talk about the selection panel. So um, we sent out an RFP in December of this uh, past year, and we got 
uh, 12 responses, 10 of which were actually directly responsive to our RFP. Two of them sort of gave us brochures uh, rather than respond to the questions we were asking. Of the uh, uh, 10 responders, five of them proposed, uh, five manufacturers listed here proposed uh, steel wheel on steel rail systems. Uh, three manufacturers, shown on the top of this slide, uh, came up with rubber tire on concrete. Uh, in the case of the Phileas bus, which is one that has a great number of advocates locally because of uh, promotion by Phileas, it's guided by magnets embedded in pavement. Uh, in the case of the Siemens system, it's guided by rubber tires which push on rails, side rails, so it stays within their the side rails. And with this Translore system, it's guided by a rod which sticks out, out into that sh um, uh, groove in the street. Uh, maglev technology, raising the vehicle on magnetic levitation and using a linear motor to propel the vehicle forward was the proposal or was the submittal of the uh, Mitsubishi Atochu train team. And then, uh, although there are many suppliers of monorails, the only submittal on this was the uh, Hitachi uh, proposal. And I also <coughs> should say that we said to the industry, we, we're looking for information here industry suppliers are going to be eligible to bid on this project regardless of whether they submitted or did not submit. This was simply a request for information. Tell us tell us what you've got so we can decide uh, the best way of moving forward. So uh, other suppliers are not precluded uh, from responding to the procurement for a vehicle system once we actually get there to do it. Uh, uh, I, to show that we, we tried to develop a way of selecting technology which would be uh, as fair uh, as possible. There's been a lot of press that, well, somebody had a particular idea that they wanted this technology or that technology. We wanted to do what we could to avoid bias by the panel. Uh, so the, the appointed panel uh, is, uh, uh, was handled in this way. Two members were chosen by the mayor, which is essentially the representative of the city administration working on the project. One member chosen by the uh, chair of the council, of the city council, uh, another member chaired by, uh, selected by the chair of the Committee on Transportation and Public Works. Those four panel members, because we wanted that, we wanted a, an odd number, but we wanted to make sure it wasn't uh, on one side or the other. Those four panel members together selected a fifth panel member who became the chair of the committee. We made some particular requirements for our technical panel members. Uh, the technical panel members we wanted, one should be an expert in the systems, the, the, the electronics, uh, the uh, vehicles, the uh, uh, train control system, the power system that we use for these kinds of, of, of projects. Another member should be a civil construction engineer. Um, I don't know if you recall from the total slide about the cost of this project, but typically 70% or so of the cost of one of these projects is in civil works. It's in the brick and mortar, the piles, the piers, the beams, the girders, the stations, those kind of things that, that go into making up the project. So it's a large portion of the project we wanted a civil construction expert on the team. Uh, another panel member, we wanted to be an operations expert, somebody familiar with operating and maintaining fixed guideway transit systems, and um, we wanted, uh, uh, at the uh, request of the commission, we wanted a public policy ex expert as a non-technical panel member. Uh, we also required our panel members to give us an affidavit about conflict of interest. They didn't have any interest in any of the suppliers, no financial interest in any of the consultants working on the project that they agree not to be involved in bidding on the project or their employers bidding on the project for at least three years. They're not political people. They haven't made any political contributions in Hawaii. They have no other kinds of conflicts of interest that we couldn't cover when we tried to be specific about conflicts and that they would provide fair and impartial advice. And we have these as, as notarized statements from each of the panel members. Uh, the panel members uh, and who they uh, were selected by are shown here. Um, um, Steve Barsoni, a uh, former FTA uh, Director of Engineering, was selected by the Transportation Committee Chair. The Mayor chose Ken Knight, uh, a construction expert, and Henry Colasar, an operations, it says operations expert, Mr. Colasar is actually more of a, a vehicle maintenance expert. Um, uh, 
Dr. Uh, Prevedoros from the university here, who's going to be your speaker next week, was selected as the public policy uh, 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 person on the committee. And I want to make a point because um, uh, I have a concern about Dr. Prevedoros holding himself up as a technology expert. He is not that. He was on as a public policy expert. Uh, and those, these four together uh, selected Mr. Ron Tober, who was a general manager of transit system, recently retired general manager of the uh, transit system in Charlotte, North Carolina. Are you, are you saying that Dr. Thomas uh, Norris is, is not a technology expert in his own right? I, or just that he was not chosen for that slot on the panel? Uh, he was not chosen for that slot on the panel, but I will say it is my personal, personal opinion, uh, because Dr. Pervidoris will have to speak for himself, that he is not a technology expert. Um, and here's, here's the slide on which I base that uh, conclusion. Um, the direct experience of the panel with these sorts of projects, have you built one, have you been involved in the, the planning or construction of a fixed guideway project, and, and you see it here. We tried to get people who had experience with more than one of these technologies. And the way the panel finally broke down, we have four people with experience with rubber tire on concrete systems, the same four people with steel wheel, steel rail experience. Uh, uh, three of them had monorail experience, and uh, Steve Barsoni had maglev experience from his uh, time at FTA. Uh, the first panel meeting was take, took place uh, on February 15th, 2008, uh, just a few weeks ago. We gave the material, the, the RFI was sent out in December, and, and the responses to the RFI came back about a week before the panel began met, and, and uh, uh, the city's consultant team, Parsons Briggerhoff, um, uh, put that information together in a package so that all the panel members received exactly the same information that was submitted by the uh, suppliers, by the 10 suppliers who were, uh, actually gave us material that we should evaluate. Uh, because the, if a decision was made to have the panel be a, uh, a function under the Hawaii Sunshine Statutes, a decision was made that the panel members could only speak with one another during the public sessions. And so we sort of sequestered the panel members and advised them they could not discuss their findings with one another during the following week. Um, so they, they, have, they received the material in their first meeting and uh, uh, received from the city staff a uh, description of the project and background on the project. During the next week, they read and analyzed the RFI materials. And then in the second meeting, the final panel meeting, um, uh, just now two weeks ago, uh, a week and a half ago, uh, they each made individual recommendations uh, on their findings and we achieved a, uh, a four to one consensus from the members of the panel. Uh, here's the recommendation. They recommended steel wheel, steel rail, and of course that's when the uproar sort of started uh, out in the community. Dr. Uh, Prevedoros uh, recommended uh, rubber tire on concrete. Um, I'm going to run through these slides because we're beginning to run out of time, I think. I'm going to run through these slides uh, and let you read most of the words there. Um, uh, Mr. Barsoni, who was the expert, uh, uh, retired from the federal government. Uh, and frankly, uh, let me comment that uh, uh, I knew Steve Barsoni prior to uh, his selection for this panel. And um, I would not call him a rail expert, I would call him a rubber tire expert. His, the experience of the projects that he's been on were far more oriented towards rubber tire, although while he was at FTA, the federal government, um, he was obviously involved in, in the evaluations of all uh, different technologies, but the, the primary system that he had worked on is the people who were at the University of West Virginia in uh, Morgantown, and that's a rubber tire system. Uh, Ken Knight uh, also recommended uh, steel wheel, steel rail, and you'll see the you'll see that the reasons um, uh, are sort of repetitive. These are their own words, and arrived at as I said independently without consultation with each other. But uh, many of them mentioned system reliability as an important feature. Many of them mentioned non-proprietary. Why is non-proprietary important to 
us when we implement these systems. There's two reasons. One, uh, if we select a proprietary system at this stage and then we go to the manufacturer, he's already been selected, we take a non-proprietary price. If some of you are involved in procurements for the government, you realize that uh, there's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to negotiate a fair and reasonable price in a, in a proprietary environment. Uh, that bidder knows that you, you're going to buy his product and, and uh, uh, he can price it accordingly, whereas in a competitive environment, they all have to uh, uh, bid against one another. Uh, another, another factor is when we buy a proprietary system, we buy a system from one single manufacturer that is only he can supply, and we want to expand the system or modify the system in any way in the future, we have to go back to that sole source supplier. That's kind of like saying, well, my first car was a Chevrolet, so I have to buy Chevrolet for the rest of my life. Um, Henry Colasar, again, highest level of future com competition, a mature technology, okay, yes, he said mature, mature technology, low, low risk in implementation if we, if we go for the first time with a new system, it's a higher risk of implementation. Now, um, I'll put it up on the board, but I'm sure Dr. Perpidoros will talk next week uh, about his um, uh, recommendations. Uh, let me point out a couple of these, however, that I have, I personally have a problem with. And, uh, uh, you know, normally when I work for a, a government agency like this, we're told, well, you have to be sort of unbiased. But I think at this point in time, uh, there's so much out here about the system that we can talk and, and tell you uh, a little bit more what we really feel. Traffic congestion with rail will be worse than it is today. Traffic congestion is not dependent on the technology that is selected. If we build an elevated busway that carries the same number of passengers, the effect on traffic congestion is going to be exactly the same as the effect on uh, uh, of a rail system. Same with a monorail, same with a maglev. It isn't technology dependent. Traffic congestion depends on the cars on the road. Well, with the exception that if you build an elevated busway, the buses can, can go all the way up to the residence, residential subdivisions and feed directly onto the elevated busway, whereas with the, you know, which, which is a major incentive for people, whereas with, you know, having to take a bus down to the station and wait and, you know, or, or park there, whatever. So I, I would say you're incorrect. I, there, there are some definite differences between an elevated busway and the other fixed uh, kinds of systems in terms of their ability to reduce congestion. Well, I'll, I'll, respect, I'll respect, respectfully disagree with you. I think I'll show some slides that may make that point in a few seconds. Um, uh, rubber tire technology offers comparable or superior technology. Frankly, Dr. Premadoros uses, uses um, this is, in my opinion, a place where uh, uh, you can take a lot of statistics from a lot of different sources, put them together, and you're not necessarily putting them together in the same, in the same uh, manner. I think there are very, very few transit professionals, people who've worked in this industry uh, over any period of time, who would say that the rubber tire systems, the bus systems, offer uh, superior capacity. However, capacity is not our problem. I, I will concede that the bus systems can handle the capacity that we are forecasting to utilize on this system, and rail systems can forecast. So if one has is superior to the other, I believe rail to be superior, clearly superior, um, I don't think it makes a difference. They both can meet the travel demands in appropriate configurations that this, that this car will carry. Rubber tire has better acceleration, deceleration, turning ability, and climbing ability. Again, I may disagree with some of these specifically, but it doesn't have an effect on our, our problem. We can make trains accelerate fast enough to be unsafe for the passengers in the train. We can make rubber tire systems accelerate fast enough to be unsafe for the uh, standees in the rubber tire systems. So the, the, the controlling factor is not how fast can you make it go, how big the motor is, what the acceleration rate is, the, the, the controlling factor is what the safety is of the people in the, in the vehicle. I've seen people in both buses and in, and in rail systems fall over because the train braked in an emergency braking mode. We have to control, we have to control 
the acceleration and deceleration of these systems based on ergonomics, based on what the, what the pad riding public can stand. Uh, could you state in, a, in one sentence what you think the problem is? The problem is for, for acceleration and deceleration? No, no, no talking the, about. the problem that this system is designed to solve. You said that, that capacity is not the problem. What is the problem? What are we trying no, to no, solve no. here? With carrying the number of riders is what we're doing. The number of riders is what we're trying to solve. What I'm yeah. suggesting is that a rail system can carry the number of riders we forecast for this corridor, and a bus system can carry the number of riders forecast for this so, corridor. So the issue is, is how much patronage you have. Absolutely. And if patronage is a function of the technology, then sure enough, you know, the technology does control, uh, you know, whether the the solution addresses the problem. Yes. Quick, quick, quick moderator comment. Um, we wind down towards the end with the pizza. It's really important to have a dialogue. So if you don't mind, I'm going to inject the microphone in the audience here and there. Hopefully, with respect to Dr. Prevederos and any future speakers, we'll um, let them speak for themselves and we'll move to the rest of the presentation so that we have a little dialogue before it all ends. Um, uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'll try and move on. Uh, so I mean, before before you move on, did uh, didn't uh, Dr. Ferradaris also mention the noise difference? Uh, I'm going to mention the noise in just a second. Yes, Dr. Ferradaris has his opinion. I have mine. Um, so I'll I'll pass over uh, Mr. Tolbert's in, in interest of moving along. And the next steps, uh, as Toro mentioned, uh, the council is considering the recommendations of the uh, panel, and uh, assuming they make. Uh, a decision on April 16th, which we all expect that they will. Work on the technical specifications for the system will begin April 17th, and uh, the vehicle procurement process will begin in late this year. Uh, a couple of points about uh, uh, consensus of the panel. Uh, a consensus means the four to one opinion, uh, uh, and here are, here are the points I think they've been made uh, enough. So let's talk about uh, the systems. This is a, a few slides, the same slide from Miami that Toro used, of the kinds of vehicles, elevated guideways, stations with uh, canopies on them, as you see here. Now, uh, I wanted to hit uh, the rubber tire because we're, we're seeing this all over the place. This is a brochure that's been widely distributed, and it's only one page of several pages uh, of where the competition is going. Uh, with these kind of recommendations. What you see here are claims for the APTS Phileas Magnet Bus, Super Magnet Bus. Uh, it says uh, that it can be built for one-tenth the cost, one-tenth the cost of an elevated guideway. Uh, it's going to be Super Express, that is, all vehicles are going to get on something, I don't know what it is, H1 perhaps, and run into the city, or are they going to get on a fixed guideway? If they're going to get on a fixed guideway, we've got to build it. And, it, and whether it's holding up a bus or holding up a train, it isn't going to be done for one-tenth the cost of the train. The, the, this vehicle imposes a load on the guideway of approximately 185,000 pounds in a span. The train imposes a, guide, a load on the guideway of approximately 220,000 pounds in a span. You don't build, you don't support 185 kips what we call 1,000 pounds, you don't support 185 kips for one-tenth the cost that you support 220 kips. That's math, it's engineering. I don't know how many engineers are in the room, but that's just the way it is. Um, they also say it's gonna be built in two years. The second on the right at the top. We're gonna to build 20 miles, maybe they're gonna build less guideway, I don't know, but if you're gonna build 20 miles of elevated structure, the kind of concrete structures that you see on that on those slides that I've shown, you don't do it in two years. It's a major construction project. And it just can't, these, these kind of claims which are going out there and are just waiting, let's just do the busway. It's a tenth the cost. Tell me the, how uh, those time projections, is that based on being on a fixed guideway or on surface? Well, it, it says it's express uh, someplace here. Uh, or elsewhere in their brochure, it says it's running express from EVA to downtown, for example. They, they talk about express service from EVA to downtown. 
If it's express, it's either on the it's either on the expressway or it's on a fixed guideway. My understanding is they're saying it's on a fixed guideway. With respect to the express definition, then does this mean that the express bus service supplied by the city is not in fact an express service? I don't know. Because I, I do live in Eva, and it is that an Eva Express bus that we have waited and hoped to pray for. So I just would be careful with but the fine. Are there are there express buses running from Eva? People ride them. My good friend, at 4:45 in the morning, we have standing room only on the buses. Take it from somebody who's watched every single one of them pass by respectfully. I'm not suggesting these buses are are, are not standees. I understand. I'm suggesting they're not express. Well. We, we do things to the great leadership of the city and the mayor have some express buses and we could use more, of course. But I just be careful with that definition because many of us count on that. Well, okay. Then, and they don't get to go on the uh, fixed guideway. Well, and then maybe that's maybe that's the answer to one-tenth the cost. It's, it's not a fixed guideway system. It's buses on freeways. Correct. Okay. My point. Okay. Um, if it's buses on the freeway, this system doesn't work. It's got the magnet on a, a, to guide it. So if you mix it up with the rest of the traffic, it cannot go on the same plane. So it seems like there's a lot of um, e-logic to their explanation of what this is. So we interpret that this they're talking about some kind of an exclusive right way. So that's how we interpret it. It's like you have to have con uh, either construct the exclusive right of way in the in form of the viaduct or take the lane out and, and they reserve that for the, these buses only. Because the, the technologies don't mix if you don't have um, exclusive right of way. I thought that, the, that their proposition was that the hybrid would be that the unserved communities like Manoa, Eva, and even the airport could be serviced by these at the surface, and then they ascend the very well-guided uh, fixed skyway to be at an elevated height because we need more carrying capacity. And then, of course, as a resident of Eva was a compelling argument, and as I've understood from presentations, the magnetic, and we're, we're a technology group, so we want to know how deep is that magnet in the concrete and what's the maintainability of it and whatnot. And so that was, of course, a compelling argument. And as somebody who's been very involved both with the Ombo Neighborhood Board and um, the transit-oriented development, I have to wonder when I come into Waipahu, how much higher, for instance, than the current road structure the fixed guideway will be to accommodate this this rail. So, you know, there's, there's just a, it seems a sensible proposition and it seems such a fray to, uh, a shame to hear someone who's not represented um, almost slandered. We're here for knowledge and objectivity and I think that people's opinions speak for themselves. Two things wrong with what you just said. Um, if this is to have ramps and go on to a fixed, another fixed guideway or elevated structure, we cannot afford it. Okay? There's no way we can build these things. And, and there, I'll say this, the people who are saying that this thing can be built cheaper, and I think Simon was just about to get into it, that the $25 million per mile. Okay, those are not people that actually study this thing. They just say that. I haven't seen any scientific, engineering, even contractors in this thing to agree to this amount. It's just a made up number. So if, if when you talk about the separate structure, we have to be talking about substantially more cost. And then whenever you talk about, okay, we run on a surface street and get onto this guideway, we're talking about ramps. And I know Panos talks about, oh, we can make this short ramps. No, if this is, truly traveling at 50 plus miles per hour, as they say it is, the merging lane, safe merging, is going to be about 1,500 uh, feet. The, so there's a lot of illogic to what they're saying, and that's what frustrates both Simon and me. This doesn't make sense. Um, the, uh, there's been a lot in the press, uh, admissions from the city, that 
this system, this mass transit system, will not reduce traffic congestion. They admit that it will not reduce traffic congestion. My, my, and I think that's probably true. Uh, my question is, if it will not reduce traffic congestion, uh, why, do, why do we want it? If it, I mean, is it just so that we can be a city that has a, a, a rail type uh, transit system uh, like other cities uh, on the mainland? Um, another, another point I'd like to make is that it seems to me that the, the problem, the root problem that, that results in long transit times is because the the initial section of the freeway that was built back in the late uh, 50s, uh, early 60s, was the the area from, say, uh, uh, Punahou to uh, Middle Street. That is the, the narrowest section of the freeway, and yet it is the, the section of the freeway that carries the most traffic. Everything merges into that. I can go from Makakilo to uh, Middle Street in 20 minutes, that's 20 miles, as I did today. And to get from Middle Street to Punahou takes me 40 minutes, which is just a few miles, and then it opens up again. So it seems to me that this system doesn't address the problem that we have. And if it doesn't address the problem, certainly according to the mantra that, that Mufi Hanneman brought in, you know, do we need it? Uh, can we afford it? You know, can we afford to maintain it? Uh, the answer to those things is no, on all, all counts. Um, it, it seems to me also that we haven't really explored the alternatives that will have potential to fix the problem. Number one, synchronizing the traffic lights on Nimitz Highway, for example, and Dillingham. That's not being done. Uh, Rideshare taxis. I know, right? Share taxes. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I appreciate that. We're gonna we're gonna answer these questions in a minute because a lot of us have these same kind of questions. But we got about three more slides to get through here, so we're gonna get through those first, and then we're gonna take some questions. And these gentlemen are gonna be outside when we go outside for pizza, so you can you can ask all the questions you want there. Simon, if you go ahead and finish. All right. I, yeah, there's a couple more points that I just have to make. I'm dying to make, so I'm gonna go ahead and make them. I made my point about the elevator. Uh, elevated structure. I want to make my point about number three. Uh, rubber tires are quieter. The, uh, the, the, the people who speak against this are just fond of making that point. We have the measured data from the suppliers submitted with their response. Uh, the, the bus system measures at 84 dBA at 50 feet from the guideway and pass by. The rail measures at 75 dBA. Uh, I assume that with a technology group like that you understand uh, dBA and how loud the noise is. Bus systems are simply not quieter than the rail systems. You can go find, you can go to New York and find a noisy rail system. You can go, you know, you can go find a noisy bus too. You can find noisy things, but when we do do our job right with modern systems, uh, the rail systems are are quieter as measured by the. This is information supplied by the uh, manufacturers. Uh, and then uh, the safe the safety issue, uh, we go through in transportation. We go through an enormous amount of effort uh, to demonstrate uh, the safety of our systems. The Philly system has not gone through uh, its safety certification uh, at this point in time. Let me, let me just finish the, finish the slides. Here's, a, here's an example of um, uh, station widths. Uh, we had one of our guys just sketch up quickly what's the issue of well, why, is, why is a station for a bus system with individual buses that have to bypass uh, each other at, at um, stations? And, and uh, most of these busway systems are actually built with two bypass tracks, two bypass roadways instead of just one. This, this quick sketch shows a single bypass so that that middle, that middle road, buses are stopped at, at uh, bus stops on the, uh, on the two sides. But since we have express buses that are run by them, they have to have a place to go by. And uh, so that middle lane in his sketch would be bi-directional, typically, uh, as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, so, the, so the bus station is considerably, the bus station is considerably wider. Now, I didn't understand, perhaps we're just going to do the buses on the expressways and not have bus stops uh, along the guideway. They'll just run the road and then 
run up ramps to these uh, expressway systems, then we won't have to have the problem of, of um, bus stops with bypass lanes on them. Uh, here's a busway. Uh, uh, now this isn't running with Phileas buses, this is running with regular city buses, but the Phileas bus is simply a longer <coughs> version of this same vehicle and gives you an idea of a, a typical station with, with two lanes in each direction, so this is even wider than the sketch uh, I just showed, and the bus is all lined up coming into that station. You can imagine the um, uh, congestion problem that they have there. It's just not a widely used around the world practical uh, solution, although there are a, a fair number of, of uh, busways. Uh, this one's built at the surface. Uh, if we're going to do this as a exclusive uh, above grade system, we've got to put all, everything that you see here on the surface, we've got to put up in the air. Uh, and the rest of this, I think, is, uh, is uh, simply the next steps in the project, so that's about uh, the end of the presentation I have since we've run out of time. Thank you. We've got five people that want to ask questions out here, and Ron had seven questions by himself. <laughs> All right. So if we can address his just quickly, you get, but these have to be 30 second answers, and then you can give him long answers outside because the pizza's already here. Okay. I think the most important question you have is the if this, this is not going to solve the congestion, why are we doing that? Okay, that's been misquoted so many times. We never said that this is not going to solve the congestion. What we said was that, that because of the intensity of the increase in traffic in the future, that 30 years from now, 25 years from now, traffic is not going to be better than today. But what performs the best with comparing building the viaduct, doing the busway, and everything else? Fixed skyway solves the, uh, the problem the best. That's what it is. So it does solve the congestion. What we're saying is it doesn't solve the congestion of today, 25 years from now. Okay, we have another question. Okay, uh, I have seven questions too, but I'm just going to ask two. Number one, yeah, number one, uh, the operating and maintenance expense of the rail, you never addressed never gave you a number. You just contradicted yourself. That we gave you a number. It right. seems like there are two different uh, ridership numbers are on the chapter four of the uh, alternatives analysis. It's right there. 90,000 riders a day on a fixed highway. Right? So that thing is in the, in the report. But now, in terms of the cost, that I think is a very important point. And in fact, I'm glad that you reminded me to uh, tell people. The primary reason why we're doing this is because in the long run, it saves more cost than incre uh, simply increasing the buses. It's a very simple math. The 80 percent, on that, uh, 70 percent of the cost of running bus is labor. For each bus you buy, you have to have a two drivers and a three quarter of the mechanic. It's a very labor intensive system. So when you continue to increase the bus fleet size to match the ridership of the future, that cost exceeds same capacity or better capacity provided by fixed highway. So it isn't the case of we cannot afford it. It's more like a, we cannot not to do it. We cannot afford not to do it. It's like a, a solar, right? You, you invest now, in the long run, it saves money. What is the number? What the number is correct. You've given us two different numbers for the operating and maintenance expense. One is the total system, including the buses. 260 whatever million dollars, I don't remember exactly. But the $60 million uh, cost is the, that's the amount of the 260 allocated only for the operating, the fixed guide system. Okay, but just that those two are the same numbers. I, I think the question is, how much a year after this thing is constructed is it going to cost? Is that the 260 million? In future dollars. In future dollars, right. Okay. In, in year 20. All right, we got one more 20 right, second but, question. But you always have to look at the other alternative to compare it. Yeah. It's not like a 260 million now compared to 150 million today. It, it doesn't work that way. 150 million is today's dollar right now operating in the buses. 260 is in year 2030. 
how much it's going to cost. And out of that, 60 million is for the transit. Ah, okay. When you had the chart that showed all of the schedule going way to the out years, is that represent what the federal government is asking you to produce and show as the system that they're making a judgment on of whether or not they feel it meets the federal criteria to be worthy enough to use federal tax dollars. Yes. So that, that <clears throat> number annualized plus the annual operating expenses, the amount that they look at in total. Yeah, what I'm saying is that high capacity transit corridor is in fact a title given to an application package for new start funds. All of the, everything that you've described is held in the envelope called a new start applications package. It never began, as I understand it, as the public and the city council and the mayor saying, we have a traffic problem. This is a solution. Now let's see if we can find funds. It was a description of, of what was constrained by the federal new starts fund application package. I kind of lost it. You mean new starts project that we're going to be. Uh, it allowed you to describe the managed lanes in the evidence analysis as a non transit solution. It was advertised in terms of it being that was one of the topics on it. It gave, in other words, it, it was there, but it was a non transit solution. And the application no. package you were pursuing was for a transit. No, the, the first step of alternatives analysis is not the outline for the future grant or anything. That's the that's to convince the feds that we did these uh, analysis for all transit options. Managed lane was considered as a transit option. It says right in the report that it's not a transit option. No, it does say that. It is a transit option. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in the, included in it. Okay, if we didn't have it as, as a transit option, Feds wouldn't fund it. Okay, that's about the 30 second answer. Guys, I try not to serve cold pizza, so. <laughs> we, well, we have one more question. One more question, but uh, has anybody thought of just limiting the number of cars the island can hold? We, we, we actually always talked about that. And in fact, the way back when, um, 1992, when Arno Morgado killed this project, that's what he said. I have a political will to limit the number of cars. What happens 17 years, nothing happens. Right? In fact, I have a real magical solution for the traffic for tomorrow. You pick up your um, neighbor, increase the occupancy from 1.2 average to 2.0. You're not going to have a traffic problem for the next, next 50 years. Is that practical? That's, a, that's an interesting approach. All right, let's tell them thank you. Thank you. Tuesday evening, so come back and join us then. Pizza and soft drinks are outside.